Are you a business owner looking for real advice and input? You're in the right place. From concept to launch to growth, funding and beyond. Welcome to Startup Hustle with your hosts. One once sold a business for $150 million. The other, the author of Million Dollar Bedroom. Here are your hosts of Startup Hustle, Matt DeCourcy and Matt Watson. And we're back. Another episode of Startup Hustle. Matt DeCourcy here with Matt Watson. Hi, Matt. Hey, what's going on, man? I'm thirsty. Thirsty, thirsty, thirsty. thirsty. Yeah, I'm thirsty, man. I've been working hard, been recording the podcast, been talking a lot, and I just think it'd be cool to have a nice glass of milk. Sounds delicious to me. Maybe root beer milk. Is that a thing? It is. Oh, well, before we talk about how the milkman's going to bring me this drink, I do need to mention that today's episode of Startup Hustle is brought to you by Fullscale.io, helping you build a software team quickly and affordably. Software is not the subject today. We're going to go old school, old school and new school at the same time, uh, a subject that is near and dear to to my family roots and uh, and obviously to today's guest, who is Matt Chateau, the CEO or founder of Chateau Home Delivery and a modern day milkman. Is all this true, Matt? It's true. Thanks for having me. Yep. Now we're back to a triple Matt episode, so we'll see how that goes. The one thing I do know is that today's episode is going to be awesome because of Matt. So... (laughs) Well, and, and he so has to first it. vindicate me that there is such a thing as root beer milk. Yeah, Absolutely we'll, we'll get into is. that. But I want I, I want to hear thing. the backstory. I want to hear the backstory now. I and I, but I have a brief one of my own. So my family was in the ice cream and milk business until the early '60s, and here in Kansas City was a fairly well known name when it came to milk and ice cream. And it's been well over 50 years since we've been in that, but I've got a large collection of DeCourcy milk and ice cream memorabilia. Um, so I, I see that around and I'm, I'm reminded daily of, of the history of, of milkmen. So I'm excited to have Matt on here to talk about how that's changed. Cause you know, I, I've grown up listening to aunts, uh, uncles, uh, you know, my dad and my grandfather are always talking about, you know, the, the milk truck, the delivery, all the different stuff. And it's pretty cool. So Matt, give us a little backstory about Chateau uh, Home Delivery and you can find Chateau Home Delivery at ChateauHomeDelivery.com. Yeah, no. Well, first and foremost, thanks so much for having me. It's a, it's an absolute pleasure. <clears throat> and uh, sounds like you have some wonderful history as a, as a family in, in the dairy world as well. And so um, we're no different. We have a dairy farm that's been in our family for well over 100 years. We did the milk company thing, started in June of 2003, and um, have been very successful. Thanks so much to some wonderful local folks um, out there supporting our, our local family dairy. I was working in the corporate world for about 15 years and thought, you know, all these people are reaching out and saying, hey, we need to have the old fashioned milk truck back. We need to have a milkman back. And I always really wanted to do it and make it happen. But of course, life gets caught up with, you know, corporate world and the idea of trying to make a, a living for family and everything else. And um, finally, I got an opportunity about five years ago to um, abandon the corporate world gig and, and move to start a few different companies. And one of those companies was Chateau Home Delivery. Um, and when we did it, we was focused much more um, than just on getting Chateau Milk Company products to, to local consumers. It was really focused on providing an outlet for local producers, top of category local pro- producers, whether you made bread or milk or eggs or um, pizza, pasta, coffee, anything in between, um, getting those suppliers an opportunity to get their local goods to local people that were searching for a one-stop shop for truly local items. So that's how we started about five years ago. And um, of course, the, everything else is history, as they say. Um, we really didn't um, have a growth plan that looked like what the last two months has provided based upon what the world has done and how it's changed due to the pandemic. But um, we're in a much different place today than we even were two months ago. So I, I'm at ChateauHomeDelivery.com right now, and I see you have your own line of milk and other stuff. And I admittedly hadn't done enough research. So you're also a delivery vessel for other local 
providers because I see Jack Sack stuff in here and other local barbecue meat, different stuff like that. Is that part of what helps make the modern milk delivery a little more feasible at, overall as a company as opposed to just bringing, say, milk or ice cream or butter? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the margins on on a half gallon of milk wouldn't be able to be sufficient to support a a true home delivery effort throughout the metro or really for, throughout a region. So we would either have to make that up by either a higher delivery fee or adding additional products. And it just happened to work out that our focus and our goal was trying to get more local goods to local mouths. And by doing that, that's allowed us to increase that average order, which in turn has allowed us to create the revenue needed to sustain the company. So Watson, do you, are you, you're actually shopping at the store now, but you weren't shopping at the store prior to the pandemic, <laughs> which doesn't make any sense to me, but you know, whatever. I mean, now you had become a bit of an Instacart guy over the I have, last yeah. few months. But I haven't so, used Instacart since before March, before all this started. And you're I think completely backwards is, compared to everyone else though, but yeah, sure. I think I just want to get out of the house. <clears throat> I'm not. Okay. I'm not so, scared of dying if I go to the of dying if I go to the grocery store. Okay, and I know there are people that are scared that they're going to die from coronavirus if they go to the grocery store. I'm not scared of that. So I'm happy to get out of my house and go somewhere. <laughs> it's the well, one thing being, I can do in life right now is go to the grocery store. Being being, I was going to say being cooped up with four boys, one of which is, is a three week your uh, three week. Uh, old newborn might have something to do with yeah. that. Yeah. No, when my wife no, says, no. we need bacon, I'm like, out of here. I'm, I'm gone. <laughs> so I'm on the other side of that because I wasn't a grocery. We weren't a grocery delivery household. My wife would go to wherever she went, a variety of places. And we've actually turned that around. I'm actually pretty excited to see this. Um, one of the things that And we've talked to, we've had him on the show before, uh, Chris Kovac at Riverwatch Beef. Um, has saw a significant uptick in his orders. In fact, they're sold out of most of most of the stuff that they have. Uh, Matt, are you seeing the same kind of response for your home delivery services? Yeah, it's been unbelievable, honestly. Um, when it first started, we were kind of on the fence of, you know, what impact is this truly going to have on us and what opportunities is it going to provide? We grew about 200% in about two weeks um, as it relates to number of customers as well as overall sales. And, you know, at first blush, that's wonderful, right? I mean, everybody's like, oh, if we could grow 200%, that's terrific. The problem was there's no way in the world that we could be set up to scale that quickly. And so um, through that process, we had our own issues about trying to maintain you know, the customer service that we expect to provide our customers, maintain the number of deliveries that we're able to do in a day in a timely way and all that stuff. So we had a lot of hurdles throughout that period, but absolutely we've seen a huge increase. Even with our suppliers, we've had a lot more difficulty. You mentioned Riverwatch Beef. We have some local beef providers that we offer products from um, them. Our egg provider has been hit so hard because there was such a shortage of eggs and grocery and everywhere else. And we finally got through that. We use Campo Lindo here out of Lathrop, Missouri. Um, but you know, even with them, they caught up on eggs. But now the issue for them is supply chain on cartons, which you would never think about. They cannot Weird. get egg cartons to fulfill the need for their customers. So now they've increased their egg production. They've got all these new chickens and all these eggs, but unfortunately they can't get them to market because the supply chain's not caught up with them. So we're absolutely seeing the struggles and the benefits of of all that. Well, and I have a question here. So, so at this point, do you have like two distinct businesses? Do you have Chateau, the dairy, and then you have Chateau home delivery. Do you think about them as completely different businesses? Yes, absolutely. So legally and emotionally, we look at them very, very differently and and as standalone. And so how long has the home delivery been going? About five years. See, I never even heard of it until today. I didn't even know it was a thing. Now, I I had actually assumed that Chateau delivered milk. I mean, have you guys always delivered only milk until now? No, no, no. So we've always delivered more. And honestly, that was, it's a catch 22 for us, right? I mean, we had day one, we had 4,000 people sign up for a home delivery service and that was because of the milk company name and the, the, the surname associated with it. Um, and so that was positive. But then the flip side, the negative of that was everybody associated the company only with delivering Chateau Milk Company products. And so the hurdle and the challenge for really the last two years 
has been, you know, taking that great foundation that we had and trying to educate the population, which it sounds like we didn't do a very good job since you didn't know about us, but trying to educate the population, number one, that we exist, and number two, that we are 750 local products strong um, that really can get you most anything that you would ever want. I love it. I didn't really have it. Yeah, there's an impressive line of stuff in here. I mean, go to go to chateauhomedelivery.com. Now, is we have listeners in 190 countries. I'm assuming this is only a Kansas City area thing, right? It is. Yep. Okay. So for all of our California listeners, which by the way was the most popular state to listen to Startup Hustle last month. Thank you. A little surprising, but maybe not. I think that's where 25% of the country lives. Now, speaking of which, do you have plans to expand this outside of the KC metro area? Well, I mean, we're always talking about what's next. Um, the milk company just um, entered the Dallas market through a grocery chain down there, um, and that's been very positive. But at the end of the day, we're some local local folks looking to do some local things. And um, especially right now, we're quite busy in trying to keep up and, and maintain what it is that we have going on on the home delivery side. So while it's in the back of our mind right now, we're kind of preoccupied with just making sure that we're doing what we know how to do right so one of the things as I've grown up and people identified uh, the DeCourcy name, with, and like I said, it was mainly mainly older people that had gone on a date and drank DeCourcy or you know had a DeCourcy ice cream or something. Uh, you know, people would say, "Oh, well, your family was in the dairy business. Do you have a farm? Do you have cows? Do you have chickens?" Our our family never owned any of that. They were they were never they were never never had the farm. They were basically <laughs> processing of that is that what you do or are you similar to like so at river watch beef they raise the cows yeah so we're distinctly different than it sounds like what your family business was growing up and really every other quote dairy in kansas city that offers a dairy product so we are the only chateau milk company is the only um, dairy farm that actually owns cows that um, you can come out to the farm visit we host about one hundred sixty thousand people a year at the farm uh, for tours um, people could come out, milk a cow, pet the baby calves, see exactly how we do everything. Um, so yeah, no, we're, we're fully integrated from, from baby calf all the way to grocery store. And, uh, we, we like it that way from the standpoint that we can really control quality. We can make sure that our animals are well taken care of, and we can ensure that our customers are getting exactly what it is that we're saying that we're giving them. Watson, it sounds like there's a field trip in order. We, I think the listeners want to hear your firsthand account of milking a cow. Yeah, I think so too. And I'm 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 busy shopping right now. Well, hey, but are you in on milking the cow? Is the important that's become the new focal point of the episode. So, can you, I you can I buy a cow too? Can I buy a whole cow? Not from us, but we can what put you in contact with somebody again <laughs> and have it home delivery. I, I, <laughs> well, I, had, I had already been checking your homeowners association's policy on livestock. It's not friendly. I'm not going to tell you why I was looking into that, but um, yeah, so I don't think you're going to be able to pull it off. Okay. All right. So it, the, the dairy business has changed a lot over the years. And, and according to my grandfather, he had sold the dairy to a larger chain that had consolidated, you know, dairies used to be very fragmented. You know, I mean, talking like true neighborhood dairy kind of stuff. Um, how is how is it in this day and age competing against mega producers? Uh, that's a tough question. So when we were milking our cows and selling it to a co-op, it was difficult, right? Because the co co-ops own you know ninety percent of all milk in the fluid milk in the in the United States. So. We really had no say. It was like, this is what we're giving you for your product, and you're going to be happy with it. And if you can pay your bills, great. If you can't, don't. That's exactly why we started Chateau Milk Company in 03. We saw commodity prices going up, milk prices going down. It doesn't take a genius to realize that red numbers aren't good. And so we thought, we have to do something new if, if our family is going to maintain this way of life that they wanted to do. Um, and so it was very, very difficult. Um, but since we've kind of went out on our own, we're a pro producer processor. That's what you call folks that milk the cows and bottle the milk. Um, really, we've kind of insulated ourselves from any of that competition because in our view, we're very different than anything else on the shelves. We're not a commodity dairy product. You'll see that in our pricing. Hopefully you see that in our quality. Um, and so our desire was to set ourselves apart and really try to focus on making the best, best dairy product products possible. And um, to this point, we don't really feel like there's competition in the market that would make us um, see them in a way of, of being a true competitor. So 
Next question in Congress with that. You mentioned that you escaped or left the corporate world. How the hell did you become a dairy farmer after? Was that something that, I mean, that, that doesn't seem like a very likely path to farming. Yeah, no, no. So it's a little unconventional, right? So I grew up on the dairy farm. Our family had it in our family for over a hundred years. I was fortunate. My parents were very strong in the idea that I was not going to stay at the farm no matter what I wanted to do. Um, I was going to go to college and do what I, you know, what I could do. And so I went to undergrad at William Jewell, grad school at KU, um, entered the private sector, public private sector, and um, played around there for a while. So whenever it became time to do something new and try to figure out what I really want to do when I grew up, it was something I knew, right? I mean, the dairy business was something I grew up with. It was convenient, but also we had a, had a great company that I enjoyed the brand. I enjoyed kind of the momentum. And, um, you know, I thought if I can come home and, and take this over and start a few things new milk or a home delivery and a couple of other things, um, then that's probably what, what I wanted to do. Um, but I, I still don't live at the farm. So my wife won't allow me to go back and live at the farm because that's a different world for the suburbanite that she's been all of her life. How have you seen the business change over your lifetime then? Yeah. So night and day from selling to a co-op, right? Because, you know, my dad has always said that he really had no pride in being a dairy farmer whenever I was little, because I mean, nobody ever can you, looks can at you explain that along the way, the co-op, how that works. Cause I think that's pretty oh. relevant. I don't think most people understand that that's how milk and eggs and a lot of the stuff make it to the grocery shelf. Sure. So there's independent dairy farmers similar to what we used to be. And you would have whatever number of cows at that time we milked about 70 cows um, you'd milk your cows, go about your business, and every other day, a, a big tank truck would come and pick up your milk and take it to um, a processing facility or a transfer facility that was owned by, really, the major um, co-op of milk, fluid milk, in, in America. And so our milk at the time was being actually shipped north to a Cheez-It factory and um, was being used to make Cheez-Its. And so to that point... I mean, nobody knew who we were. Nobody knew the care that we took with our animals and the, and, you know, the importance that our, that our dairy farm was to our family. But as we started Chateau Milk Company, it was very different, right? And it really transformed not only what it was that we were able to produce and really focus on quality, but also it brought people to the farm and people started recognizing the difference in quality. And so for us personally, the transformation has been huge and the transformation from just uh, independent dairy to Chateau Milk Company. But as a broader based um, business and, and the dairy industry, dairy farmers really can't survive today unless they're a 500, 1,000 plus dairy just because the economies of scale don't work for a small mom and pop dairy farm like, like we are now and like we even more so were um, 15, 20 years ago. So how many cows do you have now? We're milking about 350. Uh, we have more than that that we own that are in the, some process of either baby calves or um, heifers or bulls or steers. So, um, we probably own closer to 500. We milk about 350 currently. So, I mean, you guys sell a, a premium product. So how do, how do you, you know, create this product differently than the normal, you know, commodity milk? Like what's different about the, the milk and the dairy? Yeah. So I think it's a few things. Um, I think it starts with the animals. Um, we, we have really top quality, um, Holstein cattle that we use um, through our dairy farm and that have been with our farm since, well, the lineage has been with our farm since my great grandfather, but uh, we take really good care of them. And we truly believe that a really good product starts with, with animals that are really well taken care of and um, fed well and, and just, you know, looked after very well. So I think that's the start. Secondarily, it has to do with our processing methods that um, you know, we employ on a daily basis. I, we try not to adulter the milk any more than we have to. And some of those things are outlined by the state and the federal regulations, but just like pasteurization, some folks want to pasteurize the milk for a very long time and at a very high temperature to get more shelf life. Um, you know, you see milk that you can get shelf life for two months. Mm -hmm. Our desire is not to do that, right? We want to, we want to be as all natural as we can possibly be and do it in a way that really preserves the natural taste of the product. So we're going to, we're going to pasteurize that milk to the lowest temperature that we're allowed to. Um, now that shortens the shelf life to 15 to 20 days, but, um, we think that we're providing a customer a much better quality product for them to enjoy by doing so. And then honestly, I think glass, obviously it has, it's a distinct look on the shelf, but 
Um, there's a taste factor to glass too. It doesn't impart any foreign odor or any taste into the product like a plastic may. Um, and we're finding it's been very interesting for us since we started of how many people are allergic to plastic and the, whatever it is that I'm not smart enough from a scientific perspective to um, talk about leachate and all that kind of stuff. But uh, we have a lot of people that you know came to our products because they could drink it just because it wasn't in plastic. And that was kind of just a a side benefit, nothing that we were pursuing or even really knew anything about when we got started. Well, and I have a feeling for a lot of these farmers, and I think this applies to kind of all industries is when you're in part of a co-op like this, it's like, you don't care as much about the quality or like, ah, the big truck comes and we, we give it to them and they buy it. It doesn't matter what we do, how we make it really, as long as we meet these minimum standards, they're going to buy it. And I think that's an opposite of, of quality, right? I mean, it, it kind of, it, it, it motivates the opposite of like, how do we make this shit as cheap as possible? Because they're going to come get it no matter what. Right. Right. And, Versus and especially with, quality product. Absolutely. And especially, um, you know, in any business dairy or not, especially when you're getting beat up on pricing through the price structure, you've got to find a way to cut yeah. costs. And to your point, if, if there's not a reward for quality, why would I invest more to do that? Yeah. And then it's all going to get mixed into everybody else's milk or go make cheese. It's, who the hell knows Absolutely. what, who knew, did there's actually milk and cheese it? I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I mean, to that point, like the taste of the milk maybe doesn't matter as much. Right. No, I think you're, I think you're spot on. Matt, how many different SKUs uh, are under the Chateau line? Oh gosh, we're probably pushing. And whenever I say SKU, I add in different, different. Me- uh, meaning sizes. that are yours, not necessarily yeah. other people's. Cause you have a lot of different stuff. I mean, I see, different types of milk, heavy cream, butter. I mean, there's a whole lot of stuff. It's all packaged and, and really well, you've branded it really well, but there's, I mean, that's a lot of work. Yeah, no. And so we probably have to specifically answer your question about 90 different SKUs um, under the milk company brand, ranging from, you know, your basic white flavored milk to your, uh, or white milk to your um, flavored milks, your traditional chocolate, strawberry, Matt mentioned root beer milk. We do some fun flavored milks. Uh, we do cream half and half. We have a full line of butters, um, ice cream by the pint, some ice cream novelties like ice cream sandwiches. And then we do some other fun things like some milk flavorizers. That's a powder that you can put into milk um, that replicates our taste for those that live in other distinct parts of the country, California, those 25%, they can get some milk flavorizer from Chateau. Um, but we also milk soap and that kind of thing. So yeah, we, we, we have a wide variety. Matt, are you ordered? Did you finish your grocery shopping? I'm really mad. There's a waiting list. I can't even buy anything. <laughs> we, we can, we can Ooh, hook you. Sounds like we need to talk about that. You mentioned. I know uh, a guy. You, uh, yeah. Is his name Matt? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we didn't really address the whole uptick in business and how you handled 200% growth. Um, how did you handle that? Not well, probably. Um, no, I, it, it's, it's been tough, to be honest with you. And I, I think to Matt's point, um, after about three days of seeing um, really registrations equivalent to what we would have originally seen in a year, um, we decided, hey, we've got to create a waiting list. And <clears throat> um, there's a good and bad from that, right? I mean, it's good that there's the desire for the service. It's bad for the fact that we have to ask people to wait, assuming that they will. Um, and it's also bad in the fact that we're saying that there's a waiting list and that there's some routes that we actually have some capacity with. So we're taking those folks off on a daily basis. Um, and we wish that we could change that, um, sooner than later, but overall it's been a stress, honestly, for our existing employees. It's been a stress for some of our existing customers just because there's a new reality, right? Um, we've tried to keep in mind, uh, the customer experience as much as we possibly can, because we truly do pride ourselves in offering not only the best products, local products possible, but doing so in a very customer service oriented way. And I think that, you know, we've had to ask for a bit of grace here and there just because of some of our days and weeks have gotten to be a little, a little unruly, but I think we're, we're now to a new normal that we can handle. And that um, I think our customers are starting to appreciate having that uh, consistency again. What, what was the hardest part of this you had to scale up? Was it having delivery drivers? Was it not having the product to, fulfill the orders or like what, what part of it became the big stress for you? 
Yeah, so I will say that our suppliers, um, being local suppliers mainly, have been terrific. So that's really not that big of an issue for us or hasn't been. My number one issue um, originally was finding vehicles, trucks, because we use a specific type of delivery vehicle to maintain a frozen temperature, uh, oh. refrigerated temperature, and an ambient temperature. Yeah, I didn't think about that. You can't just have anybody deliver this. You've got to have a sort right. of a free, actually like a freezer truck. Yeah. So, um, and they're set up from an ergonomic perspective for our, our folks too. So that was the biggest challenge. Uh, we bought two trucks immediately, which we were just lucked into, and we have two more on order that should come this month. Um, secondarily, and I think you hit it as well, it's just the employee base, right? Trying to figure out, um, you know, what we need um, to scale in the right way but also to do it in a way that I'm not creating a system that if we have contraction um, to whatever point it is, that I'm stuck with an overhead cost that I, that I probably shouldn't have. And that's really no different with trucks too. The great thing that we've been fortunate to do is we use one time money um, for the purchase of those trucks. So we're not creating an ongoing liability, um, but that's been problematic. And then honestly with hiring employees, we hired some great, wonderful people when it first happened that were out of work because of COVID and its impact on their business. But then they actually had got the opportunity to go back to their real job, which is great for them, but it stinks for us, right? Because now we're trying to look again for phase two of employment to get new people in to train. Um, and then the milkmen, the milk folks that we use to deliver, they're a unique um, grouping of people. And we're always looking for great talent there. And it's not something that I can just put an ad out on whatever it is and, and find some great folks tomorrow. So that's a, that's been a struggle as well. That was a question I had when it comes to this. And you 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 alluded to the, the driver being, you said, an interesting group or what specific skills or personalities do you, are you looking for? I mean, do you have to have history with a dairy or with the driver? Are you looking for people that stick out, make a good impression, or are maybe even just willing to do it? Yeah. So, I mean, I think it, it is very unique from the standpoint that we have our folks go out early in the morning. So we have folks starting to leave our um, warehouse at about midnight oh, wow. and they continue to go out until about four o'clock in the morning. Um, that's a symptom of, of space, right? So another challenge has been the idea that we've outgrown our space. We probably outgrew it on day two of this whole thing. Um, but again, I don't want to incur the additional overhead of, of getting an additional space if we're going to contract back to a point where we can make this reasonable. But um, our folks have to be tolerant of the idea of early mornings. Uh, we work four 10-hour days, Tuesday through Friday. Um, that's a positive and a negative, depending upon how you look at it. Um, our folks have to be able to jump in and out of a truck and go and have a smiling face when they drop stuff off at 100 to 150 doorsteps a day. And so there's there's a certain a number of the population that really doesn't have a desire nor the um, physical capability of doing that. And so we have to make sure that we're we're training people, we're keeping them um, in proper shape and condition to do that. And at the end of the day, that they're mentally strong in the idea of most of the day they're out by themselves, right? So they're very independent. And uh, we like that. Um, we want to empower them to do their job the way they see fit and to, to meet and exceed the needs of their customers. But some people also just like the guidance. They like to be around folks. And, and obviously, that's not a job for them. And they all have to start their shift at like two, three, four in the morning, stuff like that. We do. We do. And you know what? It's interesting. So when I first started the company, I thought, you know what? We're going to do it and we're going to get everybody their milk and their goods on their doorstep before they head off to work. I rode one route with one of my first milkmen and I thought there's no way in the heck that I'm going to ask people to do this because I would never do it. So we pivoted a little bit and um, we kind of pushed that back. So we had people going back at four, going out at four and five in the morning, which is a little bit more realistic. Um, but since then, all of my guys now, they're pushing to go out earlier and earlier and earlier because they see the value of getting out and getting as much done before um, rush hour. And that's not as been as a big of an issue with COVID because not as many people are yeah. out and about. But, um, you know, if, if they can save an hour not having to deal with traffic, that's 10, 15 more stops they can get in on that day. And um, that's that's beneficial to everybody. So do you guys just leave the stuff on the front door? Yeah. So what we tell our customers is that um, they are required to have a hard shell cooler on their porch the night before their delivery. And um, with that, they can buy one from us. We have an old fashioned milk box. They can use their, you know, trusty Coleman cooler, igloo cooler, whatever it is that they have. 
And as long as it's on their front porch, we will drop that in their front porch in their cooler, and then they'll get a text message if they so choose, um, letting them know that their items have arrived. Matt, you need to add that to your basket, please. You can get the forty nine ninety nine. It's a it's a slick little cooler. It's I can't buy shelf. anything. Oh, Nothing. Dude, you we take already got your money. Basket. Take my Look, money. <laughs> we're, take we're gonna we're gonna we're phoning in an order now. All right. Before we before we move on, once again, today's episode of Startup Hustles brought to you by Fullscale.io, helping you build software teams quickly and affordably. And with that, I've got a technology question for you, Matt. So oh. the concept of the concept of the milkman and the dairy farmer not new, old school. What kind of new school stuff is required? Uh, you're talking about making 100 to 150 deliveries it, with maybe with one truck. How do you coordinate all that? I mean, is it is it is it uh, is it technology? Is it just good old paper and pencil and some organized people? Like, what what, what are you doing with that? Both in the past and how has that evolved? Sure. And, and so since we're relatively new, I'll speak to the past from some other folks that have been in the industry for 100 years that we have talked with and consulted with when we got started. We went out and visited a dairy in Rhode Island, um, Monroe Dairy, great people, and they've been doing it for 100 years. And they still had their their milkmen with route cards on their truck, whereby it would say, go to Mrs. Smith's house. It's at this address. And then you're going to take a right and then two lefts and a right and a left. And then you're going to be at Mr. Jones's house. And I knew exactly what we weren't going to do. And that was that because, I mean, there's just no way I could expect our folks to, to make that work. And it's just not efficient. And so <clears throat> while it works for them and that's what their history has been, we knew that we needed some technology, some software, some system that would allow us to both integrate ordering, online processing, all of our procurement and inventory controls and everything else in one spot. Um, and so we moved in a direction that was a company that has been serving the dairy industry or the home delivery industry for probably about 10, 15 years. Um, in all honesty, there's not a lot of competition in that area. Um, we wish there was more. Um, we find that the system that we use is good. It provides what we need today, but there is like everything opportunities for improvement. And we think that, um, we can truly get in combination with, um, providers that we're looking to get into the market, the opportunity to really do some really cool things. I think what we find our biggest challenge on a daily basis right now is nothing related to daily operations or even consolidation of products into orders or anything else. It's more so just the simple routing of all these stops. And, um, you know, that's something that's built into the software. We actually don't even use it anymore. We use a third party even outside of it to help us with the route generation. But, um, you know, that's the, that's the age old question for us is how do we become more efficient in delivering those 150 stops within that five mile radius? Uh, right turns are good, but in addition to that, having the the understanding that we're we're getting the houses in order where they need to be to reduce you know idling costs and fuel costs and all that kind of stuff is very important to us. So you, so how complex is the IT side of this? I mean, do you like to take orders online and track how much inventory you have and and do all this route planning and how you bill customers? Like, is there a whole lot of back office complexity and software and stuff to power all that so we use a third party to to manage most of that all of that stuff's above my pay grade i'm just a dumb dairy farmer so we let people smarter than us deal in that world but um from from the operation standpoint and from the little that we do as it relates to um, integration and different changes it's it's very simple for us um, but again we we probably hit the tip of the iceberg as it relates to what the really the back end side is and when all the complexity that you would know about and, and be able to talk in much greater detail than i yeah matt, as, imagine as you get bigger and bigger you run into those sort of issues or you know the limitations of the the software you have today and then how do you scale this and deal with new challenges and well, and I think that's the big question, right? I mean, at what size do you start looking at building your own proprietary system yeah. that is built specifically for you? And and then that's the trade-off, again, of the capital investment, right? And and what makes the most sense for us going forward? And I've thought about that a lot. We've had some conversations about it. I just have not gotten to the point where I have a good answer yet, unfortunately. Speaking of answers, normally around this time on the podcast, we play mixtape the game. However, I've got a different offering for today. So 
Um, there's been a lot of, you know, normally when we play mixtape, I pull a card, we read a scenario, we all pick a song, we decide on a winner. However, today we're going to have a joke competition. And Matt Chateau, being the milkman, I have to exclude you from milkman jokes, although I have a feeling you have a bunch of them. But Watson's been messaging me this whole episode asking me if we're telling milkman jokes or not. So fuck it. We're going to have a milkman joke off here. (laughs) I've got a joke. He's got a joke. And I'm going to need you to either annihilate both of us with a joke of all time or decide that either one of ours are good. I'm going to go first because my joke kind of sucks. And I spent about 10 seconds looking it up. But, you know, so I walked in on my wife and the milkman. And the first thing she said to me is don't tell the butcher. (laughs) That's what, that's my joke. What do you got, Watson? Oh, I got this. All right. What (laughs) What do you call a milkman wearing high heels? A dairy queen. All right, so I'm not going to embarrass myself, but I'm going you to thought that was a, You thought that was a home run, Watson? <laughs> you thought that was just going to knock me out of the park? I don't know. Well, God, I think mine might have actually been better just based on delivery. Uh, you know, right. I don't, I'm not going to, I'm not going to embarrass myself, but I will suggest that I, I do think Watson won. Oh, ah. okay. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> now do you have, a, do you have a milkman joke? You know what? I, I, I have numerous, but um, I need my kids here to remind me what they are. Um, yeah, I, I, they, they, they escape me now. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, I am. I am terrible at remembering jokes. I, that is the only joke that I currently know. The one that I just told, I can't ever really remember them. So, well, Watson, you are the first champion ever of the milkman joke competition. So congratulations. We'll, we'll get you. And that's actually maybe the first, you might want to keep that rolling, Matt, because if you can put a streak together, unlike the time you lost rock, paper, scissors, 15 straight games. How do you even do that? By the way? Yeah. Mr. Chateau Watson is the Cleveland Browns of (laughs) rock, paper, scissors. Like, the mathematic probability of losing 15 times in a row. I don't even know what that is. That's a tech. That's an answer that we need to get to. So, well, once again with us today, Matt Chateau, Chateau Milk Dairy Products, Chateau Home Delivery. If you're in the Kansas City area, go to ChateauHomeDelivery.com. That's S-H-A-T-T-O Home Delivery. You have a great web store. Um, I don't, I don't say that and not mean it. A lot of people that are in the e-commerce business, I I typically wouldn't go to a dairy service and expect them to, you know, I, I'd say, Oh, it's dairy. They're not in the e-commerce business, but yeah, it's, it's done well. I, and I, I will, I'd like to compliment you. I like the fact that you have the week weekly staples bundle and stuff like that. I think that's smart. Give me my regular stuff. Boom, 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 boom. Don't make me think about it. That's definitely something I'd be into. I'm going to place an order. I might need off of the the waiting list as well. And I was just, I was literally just talking, talking to my wife about this because you mentioned Instacart and some of these other stuff. Well, you know, prior to some of this, we didn't use that a whole lot, but the the changes in our economy and coronavirus stuff have really brought me my my purchasing thought process back to local. And you know, I ordered a, after Chris was uh, from Riverwatch Beef was on the show. I ordered a, a pretty sizable meat order. It was great, great stuff. I was really happy. Chris delivered it himself, and I just thought that was cool. And I think it's important right now that we get around the stuff that's here. The the and I don't want to say the little guy because this isn't a little business. You get you're doing a lot of great stuff, and I think it's pretty cool. So we we end our episodes of Start a Puzzle with what we call the Founders Freestyle. We're going to pass the mic around. We talk about a lot of different stuff. You can uh, Matt Chateau. You will go first. W- what what would you like to add to our discussion today? It could be advice for future founders. Anything, even if it's just what you've learned uh, as an entrepreneur over the last however many years. 
Yeah, great question. Um, you know, I think from from my standpoint, we were fortunate to, to create a company um, that was focused on a lot more than just us and our brand, our original brand. And I think what has allowed us to be very successful is our partnerships with other, and to your point um, just a minute ago about local companies, other local founders, other local entrepreneurs that, and they're in different realms of where they're at in their startup phase or that they're, you know, they've been entrenched for, for decades. And I think from that process and surrounding ourselves and our company with these other small businesses that are entrepreneurial in their focus, we've learned a tremendous amount. And so it's not just that selling their products has allowed me to increase margin or anything else. I think the true value that we've received over the course of the past five years with these partnerships is learning from them on what they're doing in their business, how they're doing things different today than they did yesterday, um, how they're focusing on increasing efficiency or quality. And I think I think um, it was a, it was a byproduct of what it was that we were trying to accomplish by adding their products. But in in retrospect, I would never do it any differently because. We We've gained so much more through those relationships than we ever would have without. Master Watson, you're up. Um, I just want to point out that, you know, people always uh, say they want to have this problem of where there's more demand than you know what to do with. Like you have all these customers coming at you and people are like, oh, I want that problem. And uh, I've lived through that before and it's been hell actually. And I don't really recommend that problem. And so, you know, you're going through it now and you've had to actually kind of shut down new business because of it to throttle it. And, you know, you're, people don't think about this, but, you know, you're sitting here you're like, oh, I can make all these capital expenses. I can go hire all these people and we can staff up and we can do this. But then what happens if it goes away, right? Like these are all the challenges that you, you deal with when you, you get overwhelmed with stuff and you don't know how long it's going to sustain either. Um, but these are the fun challenges of being an entrepreneur. And uh, a lot of people always want these challenges. Most people never see them. It's most people dream of this challenge for some reason. But it's actually kind of a shitty challenge. It's like, we're doing so good that we're probably going to screw it up because we can't keep up with this. Um, it's an interesting challenge to deal with. So uh, hang in there. Thanks. Now, before I wrap up, once again, today's episode of Startup Hustle is brought to you by Fullscale.io. If you want to check us out on YouTube, you can find us at, at Startup Hustle Podcast. You can also verify that Watson and I have faces made for radio by visiting the at Startup Hustle Podcast Instagram, where we're hoping to do some live stuff soon because we never have and we probably should. Um, before I... Uh, Rock my freestyle. I have a question for both of you. Uh, how does a milkman become a priest? He becomes pasteurized. That is correct. <laughs> All right. I I was hoping you. I was hoping. I have a feeling Matt and I are are both at upjoke.com for <laughs> milkman jokes. Because I just have that connection with Watson where, yeah, we're, we, if we were going to find dumb jokes, it would definitely be from the same source. But, you know, there's a lot of things. In, and Matt, thanks for coming on. Uh, we met Matt because I made a post on social media that said, who are the most interesting entrepreneurs that you know? And one of your friends said, you got to talk to Matt Chateau. And that's how this came about. And I think that that's a a cool way to get in front of people that are doing great stuff. I didn't realize until today, and this is, and, and that I have, I have tried your cotton candy milk before. Um, because I was like, I, and that was, I, I picked that up and it was like quick trip or something like that. I, I, I remember it and I was thirsty. I was like, Oh, that sounds good. And it was good. Uh, but I, I think it's really amazing to see what you're doing here. I mentioned at the, previous at the top of the episode this is a subject that's near and dear to my entrepreneurial roots and my family um it, i i thought i had that same thought as you did like 10 years ago for me i was like should i bring de Corsi ice cream back and i started looking at it and i was like god this would be really hard this would be really difficult and so i really commend you on on bringing the family business uh in, into the 21st century per se. And, you know, the web store looks great. I love the delivery thing. I love the, the local thing. The thing that I really like the most, and this is a parlay off of Watson's freestyle. I appreciate the fact that you would rather have fewer customers and do an A plus job. Like I'm into that. 
And I think that that we're so as entrepreneurs and founders, and we're trying to raise money and talking about this, and we're all about volume, volume, volume. Let's jack the revenue up. Yeah, but if it's hollow and and it, people aren't going to stay. So what's I, I I would imagine that you have a really high lifetime value of a customer for these kind of reasons, and I think that it's important, especially in an economy right now where people are questioning different costs, expenses, and stuff like that, that you have the ability to step up for clients and and take care of the ones that have been with you the whole time as well before watering down their level of service. That was not, that pun was not intended there, but... Um, but overall, yeah, I mean, I think it's really cool. So once again, go to, go to Chateau Home Delivery, S-H-A-T-T-O, homedelivery.com. There's a lot of cool stuff in there. If you're in Kansas City area, you got to check it out. And guys, that's what I'm going to get to doing. I'm going to get my order together. I'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having me.